Hello there and welcome back to the geodynamics video lectures on the topic of the basics of fluid mechanics. In lecture two on this topic we're going to look at one-dimensional channel flows and this is part one of a two-part video lecture on channel flows. So first off we'll introduce what a channel flow is and some geological situations where channel flows occur. And then we'll begin our steps to calculating the velocity within a one-dimensional channel of fixed width by looking at the forces that act on the fluid within a channel. So channel flows basically occur any time that a fluid is flowing within a channel. Uh, you could think of that as a fluid basically flowing between two solid walls in quotation marks, two solid, um, you know, in our case in the earth it would be solid rock with a fluid rock flowing um, in between two bounding walls. And these channels can be found in a number of different geological settings. Um, they're in the uppermost part of the asthenosphere. There is counterflow um, that can occur when the tectonic plates are moving along the top of the asthenosphere. And we'll actually look at that in the fifth lecture of this video set uh, in more detail. There's flow that happens in the lower crust when the crust gets thickened in, um, in large mountain ranges. Uh, you can begin to weaken the lower crust and it will flow. There are intracrustal channels such as what's shown here on the figure of the left of some schematic mountain range here with a subducting plate moving down beneath it and this stippled pattern area here is meant to be some kind of channel that might be flowing down um, along with the subducting plate or it may be flowing back in the other direction depending on the situation. Don't worry right now about the details of how this flow works. Simply just wanted to show you another example of the kind of channel flows. Um, there's also channel flows that occur in subduction channels. So we often think of a subducting plate as simply going down um, into the earth, but there is typically a weak region above the plate that um, can facilitate a channel flow material in there. It can be hot and weak and flow um, either down again with the subducting plate or even back up the subduction channel. And then there's also um, channel flows in salt tectonics and we'll look at an example of that in the fourth video lecture in this set. So the most simple thing that we can consider is a one-dimensional channel flow in a channel of fixed width. And so the figure on top is going to be with us for basically the rest of the lecture. Um, and so here what we're looking at is basically a slice through a channel of uh, fixed width here. So this hashed area at the bottom and top would be the walls of the channel and the region in between is the channel itself. And the coordinate system here is X going along the channel, Y going across the channel. And we'll talk about what some of these um, things mean in terms of the other letters and things in this box. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in the following slides. Now the fluid, in this case, that sits within this channel uh, is going to flow with some velocity. I mean, it could be stationary, of course, but it uh, will flow based on basically two things. Uh, and that is a pressure gradient that would exist from maybe one side of the channel to the other. So in this case, the pressure gradient would be the change in pressure, P0 minus P1, divided by the length of the channel. That's simply the change in pressure along the channel length. And as you can see here, the channel in this case is length L. And you can also have channel flow as a result of motion of one of the walls of the channel. So for instance, up here where we have this U0, that's a velocity. And the arrow here is meant to mean that the top of the channel, that wall is actually moving with respect to the wall at the bottom. And that motion of the top wall can make the channel flow occur as well. Now, when we talk about the fluid that's flowing within the channel, the fluid flow um, is going to occur. And within the, the fluid, there's going to be shear stress that's essentially, in our case, acting along horizontal planes of the fluid. So if you look at some thickness of the fluid within this channel here, simply indicated as 
delta y, there's going to be shear between the top and bottom of that thickness of the fluid as a result of any change in the velocity of the fluid within the channel. And so, uh, you know, here you can see on the top of the fluid in this little um, thin piece delta y, there's a tau of y, uh, that's the shear stress at the top, and then at the bottom there's tau of y plus delta y. So that's the, the shear stress at the bottom or at the y plus delta y position within the channel. Now, our basic relationship between this shear stress tau and, um, and our velocity gradient, which is here du, dy, looks like this. So uh, we have tau equal to eta, which again is that viscosity, the dynamic viscosity, times du, dy. So that's the change in velocity across the channel du, dy. So here, as you can see, we have a stress and basically a strain rate. It's a velocity, um, change in velocity divided by the um, thickness of the channel. Now if we want to talk about how this fluid is going to flow within the channel, uh, we're going to use the equation of motion that will allow us to calculate the velocity within the channel. And that equation of motion is going to be based on the balance of forces of a layer of thickness, in this case delta y, and length l. So that's this little box that's shown here. And so in this box, we can consider the forces that are acting on the fluid. The first of the forces would be a pressure force, and that would be the pressure force acting on this little box um, along the x direction. So the pressure here you can see indicated with an arrow that's going parallel to the x-axis. And at one end we have a pressure of p naught times delta y, the thickness of the uh, piece of this fluid. And at the other end we have p1 times delta y. So the difference in pressure is simply p1 minus p0 times delta y. So that's our pressure difference across this little piece of the fluid. Now the shear stress tau and the velocity are both only a function of the distance y from you know, where we are across the channel. Um, the shear stress is going to vary across here as will the velocity and those are only going to vary in one dimension. They won't vary in two dimensions in the case we're considering for a 1D channel. So the shear force then on the upper boundary of the element, the top of it here, is going to be simply minus tau of y, so this is a function of y, times L. And L is going to be the length over which that shear force is acting. The equivalent shear force then on the bottom, on the lower boundary, at um, tau of y plus delta y times L, right? So that's just the shear force down here at this lower uh, elevation within the channel. And um, that's equal to tau of y plus delta y times L, which is also equal to tau of y, which is the shear stress on the top, plus the change in shear stress d tau dy times this little element over which the change in shear stress would occur times the length, again, of that side on which the shear stress is acting down here. Okay, so that was our pressure and shear forces that are acting on this channel. This Again, this is part one of the two-part lecture. I'm breaking it up because in the next part, we'll look at the net, the sum of the forces, and then we'll take the steps to go towards calculating the velocity in the fluid. So, if you're watching in Moodle, as you almost certainly are, it's time to take your quiz and come back for part two of 1D Channel Flows.